Well, hello, everyone. It's, it's a joy to be here to share some thoughts about service. And I'm going to uh, not have a talk with continuity. There'll be bits and pieces, and you take what feeds you and let go of what doesn't feed you as we enter into this. First of all, I like to start with a moment of silence, and I invite you to close your eyes and, and to rest in the presence of God, consenting to God's presence and action within each one of us and within this presentation. So let us spend a few moments consenting, opening ourselves to the power of the Spirit, so that each one of us might do whatever the Lord is calling us to do for the good of all. Amen. I'm going to be quoting from one of our CLP booklets that we had put together as uh, through the years. And this one is contemplative service. And, uh, and in it, there's so many wonderful little tidbits that I would like to share with you. And the first is this prayer of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And I think this sets the stage of what we're about when we talk about service, contemplative service. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. I believe this sums up what service, contemplative service, is all about. Father Thomas likes to use the, that term, you know, the cascading flow of water, you know, cascading. Well, this is a cascading of elements that are so important in our aspect of looking at service. Notice, prayer, faith, love, service, peace. And anything we do, the source of our strength is our prayer, tapping into the source of our existence and the source that's sustaining us. And with that prayer, we just don't sit in it alone. We move into faith, a belief that there's something bigger going on in what we're doing and that we're being carried. And that moves into not more hectic activity. It moves into love a genuine concern of the, for the other. Because love is really the Jesus inside of me ministering to the Jesus inside of you. And that connection is always there. Now, our words might be different, but when our words come out of our mouth or our actions come from our, our bodies, it travels towards the other person and it gets transformed. That's why sometimes when people say to you, well, when you told me this, it really made a big difference in my life. You'll see, think to yourself, I've never said that. Of course, because the prayer led to faith that met, led to a love that helped you transmit what you were doing on another level, and maybe changing the transmission from your mouth to their mouth, from your ear to their ear, from your hand to their hand. And in that, we came God being of service, not just Carl being of service. And in that service that we're doing, the end result isn't to be competitive or to be better with, uh, do better than somebody else or to get praise. The end result really is peace. And there's a wonderful wisdom uh, uh, comment that all service leads to unity, to oneness. And if your service is doing that, then you're being fed by your prayer, your faith, your love, your service. But if it's causing disunity, then in a certain sense, it's good to go back and say, what am I praying? What is my faith? In whom is my faith? Where is my love? Where is my service? Or am I just helping? So the end result of that is peace. 
Now, in 9-11, in New York City, um, the Twin Towers were attacked. You know that. There was a marvelous man, a priest, a Franciscan priest who was chaplain to the New York Fire Department. And on the occasion of that day, he was coming out of the tower because they were one of the towers because they were alerted to get out, get out as fast as you can because they were realizing that it was going to start to collapse. And he came running down the stairs out the front door of the tower. I don't know which one it was. And one of the debris, one of the, the bricks came down and hit him and killed him on that site. And there's a beautiful vision of the four firemen coming and picking him up and they carried him over to St. Paul's church and laid him on the altar of the church, the Episcopal church, laid him there until whatever had to be done was done. And in emptying his pockets and keeping what needed to be survived, you know, they, you know how you have to do that. They came upon a little prayer card and I want to read it to you. And this was his prayer. And we call it the prayer, Michael's prayer. Lord, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Tell me what you want me to say. And keep me out of your way. <laughs> I love that. I'm gonna, I'll pray one more time. I like that last line, to be honest with you. Take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Tell me what you want me to say and keep me out of your way. And that's a wonderful indication of what service is about. Now, if we want to break down service, if you would, into a four-step dance, and I love four-step dances, I applied it to prayer, to read, to reflect, to respond, to rest. There are four elements that I think are very important when we think of service. First, for God's sakes, listen. Listen to what other people are saying. You might have your agenda as to what you want this meeting to do or whatever you're doing. But the point in part is that why come and have people sitting there if you're not going to hear anything new except your presentation? I remember in going to college, you know, you would have these professors that had their, their three ring folder there and they're reading the same material that they've been reading for years and not changing anything and not taking any questions. So if you're going, you're gonna be surprised. It reminds me of a story that Ed Hayes told, the priest in the Midwest, about what service is all about. Service is, is an apron. You put on an apron because you're a waiter. Okay, and he always pictured Jesus as a waiter. And so in a certain sense, what does a waiter do? He comes over to the table or she comes over to the table and says, you know, how can I help you? But may I suggest some of our specials? And you go and the waiter goes through the specials. And then you decide whether you want to take a chance or if you want to have the same menu that you always had. Well, whatever it is. You had to listen, but in ministry, when you listen, everybody in front of you is a waiter about to tell you something that might be important for you to hear. Some of it may not be new, but some might be a special insight that will make your ministry of service different. So listen, listen, there's always an opportunity to learn. And then also in this learning process, you want to empower people to be on their own. The worst thing is when someone says, I could never do it without you. You tell them, yes, you can. You have the strength and the power. I'll be there to support you. But you want to empower for them to, in a certain sense, pick up the, the baton and run with it. One of my joys of my life is as I retired from administration and contemplative outreach, is to know people were empowered by my presence. People were empowered by Gail's presence. People were empowered by Thomas's presence to carry on. And that's a great joy you should feel when they carry on, but you're there to support them. That's service. Service is also an 
creating an atmosphere of hospitality, of making people always know that they're, they're welcome to approach you at any time to do whatever you need to do in order to help them. And the last part really is the work of the Spirit, a Pentecost, the Spirit's working through you. And that's the beauty really of, of being of service rather than just helping. Helping, there's a beginning, a middle, an end to helping. In service, there's no beginning, middle, and end. It's ongoing. I chuckle sometimes when I get phone calls from people who I've given a workshop to like 14 years ago, and they want to be helped to the next level. Well, that's the spirit working, and that's being open to hospitality, of being open to whatever comes about. And let's be honest, good service means your whole life is filled with interruptions, and God works in the interruptions of our lives, not in our plans. Oh, God works in our plans also. I overemphasize that, but it's there. So listening, empowering, hospitality, welcoming, and the spirit at work to surprise you in what's happening. The last thing I'd like to share with you is the fact, actually, remember really that you are co-creators of God working in your life. And when you're a co-creator, allowing God to work in your life, you know what you give up? You give up being successful. Oh, that is a little demon, that successful one. We're called to be faithful, faithful to the commitment of what we're about. And in our fidelity, we will be successful. So we are not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. But if we're really faithful, you will be successful in a whole different level of being. And it may even come through humiliation in a certain sense that where you thought you were going to go, you find yourself someplace else. So who cares in the bigger picture of life? Let me end with this little closing comment, if I may. Again, it's from our little booklet, Contemplative Service, the Contemplative Life Program. Service is more than helping or doing a task. It is a way of being, a disposition of the heart with no beginning and no end. Service is a deep form of stewardship for God's people and God's creation arising out of the experience of the oneness that's there with one another right from the beginning. It is a call from God to serve God and others, and as such is both motivated and inspired by divine love. And this can be summed up again with Mother Teresa in one of her sayings. Pay attention to this. It's wonderful. Love cannot remain by itself. You know, if, if love remains by itself, it's the self-serving self. That's where it ends. If it remains, if it just remains by itself, it needs to be given. It needs to be given. It has no meaning if it's just there for itself. Love has to be put into action, and that action is service, contemplative service, where we're consenting to God's presence and action and all that we're doing. And so let me once again go back to what I began with, if I may. Remember, we're people of silence. I was reading an article recently that says, unless our activity comes out of silence, it'll never be fruitful. The fruit of silence is prayer. What sustains us is our centering prayer practice, our Lexio Divina, our welcoming prayer, our forgiveness prayer. We have all the tools, but the foundation has to be prayer. And as Father Tom has said in the beginning of the spiritual journey tapes, prayer is a relationship. 
with our God. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith, real solid faith now. The fruit of faith is love. Love God, love your neighbor. The fruit of love is service. Do unto others, do unto others. And the fruit of service is peace. Amen. Thank you, Father Carl. This video will be very helpful to us to renew us and restore us uh, as uh, volunteers for contemplative outreach. I have two practical questions I want to begin with for you is the switch that Thomas wanted from the hierarchical model to a more collaborative model. Did you have conversations with him about that? And what would that mean to a local chapter? Um, how would we reconfigure our chapters to be less hierarchical and more collaborative? Well, my impression from my viewpoint, they weren't that hierarchical. Uh, all the people, no matter, like take in Pittsburgh, there were certain people that took a leadership role, but in a certain sense, there was participation on the part of other people that it, it wouldn't have gone as far and as beautifully as, as, as it's gone. So I don't know. I think in any structure, there's going to be the doers, the leaders, the protesters, and the helpers in anything. Mm -hmm. So if you want to call that hierarchical, well, fine. It gives you a, a title. What you're really trying to say is you don't want to be hierarchical You where one person has to carry the whole load by themselves. And that's how that happened. There mm -hmm. wasn't that participation, if you would, of people being empowered really to know they could help the person you know, in a special way. So, so the beauty of this is, is the fact actually, like the 12 apostles, for goodness sake, they all had gifts. Uh, uh, they all had things they had to do. Jesus let them go their way. But Jesus was the boss, if you would. And Peter, in time, looked at, was looked upon as the leader among the leaders. Now, what you can say is he was the servant of the servant, but there's always somebody or some people that keep the beat going, that keep the keep keep the the flow going and everything else. And that that's the beauty of any any service that you can give. You know. So I, I'm a, I, I love the fact actually that that more and more people are getting involved and so on. But I think that's also a product of not only a, a, a different emphasis and vision, but I think it's also the product that all of a sudden technology has allowed us to co collaborate on a much deeper level. And I think we're riding the wave of community building through technology with the opportunity to be able to meet as often as we do and to have meetings. I mean, you're not hearing people say, I can't come because it's raining outside. You know, they're, they're coming and that prepares the way to work together. So the beauty of it is the fact actually, whatever is going on, it's worked before and it's working now, even to a better degree, I think more because of t technology than anything else. It's helping us join together on a much deeper level more frequently. I agree with you. Um, over the years, I've had phone calls with coordinators I've never met face to face, but because of the volunteer work I've provided, I've received calls from them. And now doing chapter planning and prayerful discernment, I've talked to um, coordinators leaving who want to leave, and then I'm talking to new coordinator coordinators. And I have to tell you that some have said to me, I like doing everything myself, 
or they say to me, I don't like to ask people to do anything. And right. so I tell them, sometimes it seems easier just to do it yourself. But let me tell you, it's far more rewarding to do things with other people. So do right. you have anything to add to that, to the person who just, well, I'll just take care of it myself and not empower, as you're saying. And I know um, Marie Howard has come up with this policy that when you go to do a little service for contemplative outreach, bring someone with you, say, hey, Bob, come with me and help me with this. And then you teach them what to do and you have fun together and then they know how to do this. Do you, what do you say to that person who just, you know, wants to do it themselves? <laughs> what a blessing you are. What a blessing you are to give yourself so completely to this. But I invite you really to not be afraid when you feel yourself being a little overwhelmed, reach out. But I would affir affirm that person. There's nothing wrong with a person wanting to do things by themselves. If you think of some of the family situations, many moms and dads ended up having to do it themselves. And there's been fruitfulness from that. But I would encourage the person, don't be afraid to ask for help when you feel that you need that help. There'll be angels there really to help you do that. There always is. When you ask, and you ask with a real desire really to be open to receive, then I, it will happen. The people will step forward. But it's wonderful what you're doing, Ruth, is that you're creating an atmosphere, that, that third aspect of service. You know, you're creating a hospitality uh, atmosphere that people are, will be encouraged to want to help out each other and even take some ownership. I've always heard people say, I'm willing to help, but I don't want to be in charge. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. there's always somebody who has to carry the primary thrust. There always has to be a coach or a captain, but it doesn't have to be one that does it all by themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I have found that it really works if you approach people one-on-one -on -one sometimes and say, would you be our bookseller? Or would you have time to be our treasurer? They like the invitation to be identified as someone that possibly could serve that way. So there are multiple right. ways of approaching people about service. And, you know, the chapter planning and prayerful discernment is one way. That's a group experience. But right. the, And as you said, I've conducted these and many people say, I'll help. I want to be on the coordinating team, but I don't want to be in charge of anything. And right. well, I'm good on the computer. So that's a start. Or, um, you know, I'm interested in sharing books. Or it's a start. It's a beginning. I didn't it is. People like to do, and then you can work to invite them to serve like that. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how long a person should serve in a chapter? How often maybe there should be raising up new leaders? Or is that very, does that vary from chapter to chapter? Well, it varies, but you know, just like in the priesthood, okay, a person is named a pastor, it's a six year term renewable, okay? So it's good that there is a, a exit to what you're doing, you know, to have a, a number. And I think the whole idea, I think is three years seems to be a, a good number. And then um, there, they, a person can then say, well, I've given the three years, you know, uh, I, I could continue, uh, but I'm willing to step back and allow someone else to, to come forward. Now, people are going to come running. <laughs> and, oh, give, me, it's, give it to me, give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> but, but the point, actually, there might have to be like a one-year transition as the new person transitions into the job and begins to realize they can do it and they can be, can be helped. But I think having a number is is uh, very good because I think we like a beginning, a middle, an end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. I can't think of anything else. I will as soon as I turn this computer off, but you've been... <laughs> well, can you think of anything else that do you think oh. is beneficial? Um, 
you know, I tell people to go to the website. We have so many resources on the website. Oh my goodness. We have so much. Yeah. yeah. We have, you know, there's also an aspect, we, you know, we're going to be editing this. Okay. There's also an aspect that mm -hmm. there are people who are good potential leaders that don't want to be told anything. <laughs> Seriously, you know, mm -hmm. um, or the, when they take over, you'll say, well, here's, you know, here's the books, uh, here's the plans of the last three years and so on like that. And, and instead of lear learning off the other person's, like you would say in golf, but, you know, they just kind of disregard that, you know, so you, you do. And yet they turn out to be sort of charismatic leaders in their own own right. So you see, leadership takes on all sorts of shades and all sorts of colorations, you know, it, and, and um, uh, it's the, the important thing is to, to uh, find your own voice mm. and then do it by listening, you know, by empowering, you know, by creating an atmosphere of growth and by opening to the spirit, everyone has their their own voice. I remember, I remember, I had to sub for Father Thomas at Notre Dame. He got sick. This was back in the '90s, I think. And I came in, and and there, uh, the person running the um, program said, "Well, you know, you know, Father Carl, um, they are all expecting Thomas, so." There, your your group's going to be very disappointed, you know, and a Thomas is not there, and and I, I, you know, and I was very very nervous. Someone who I did not know, and I do not know to this day, heard him say that to me, and the lady came over and she said to me, Father Carl, I don't know you, but let me say this: revere your teacher, but just be yourself. It'll be fine. Nice. So we all have our style, our way of doing things, and, and God works in that di diversity. Mm -hmm. So, period. You know, that's, that's... I know one issue that comes up in chapters is people want to read certain books or watch certain videos that, you know, are kind of out there, you know, um, I don't want to name any sources, but just like really not about contemplative prayer. I always said that contemplative outreach is a specialty shop. I go to the mall and I, and I see Brooks Brothers. I don't expect to go in there and see Levi's, you know. Um, uh, you know, and name any of those stores, you know, that are specialty, specialty stores. And we're a specialty store. You have the department store down the end of the mall that has a variety of a lot of things. But unless contemplative outreach stays as a specialty store, and the specialty store is grounded, okay? Now, Thomas would never say it should, he should be the only teaching, but is grounded in those spiritual journey tapes, is grounded in uh, the tapes that he did in heartfulness and you know, God is love and, and, and you know, and, and uh, the, the gift of life. Mm -hmm. They were his teachings. And, and um, our generation in contemplative outreach went out of its way, and you were part of that, to preserve the teaching of Thomas. Now, do what you want, but make sure you're preserving his teaching and you know his teaching because they're awesome. Uh, they're 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 spirit filled. Uh, the spiritual journey tapes now that are are on, online and have been updated with new material and everything is building it on the foundation of Thomas's teaching. And and his teaching is so wise and such a good foundation. I could listen to part two of the spiritual journeys over and over again when we go through power and control, affection, esteem, security, survivor, the, the Bernie story, what consent is all about. You could build your life on that. And be, you know what I'm saying to you? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're letting air out of the balloon when we want to get the latest thing on the block. 
you know it's you know it's like i read the bible why should i look at it again you know there is there, there is enrichment there in his teaching i can't express that i can't express that enough and 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 i think that's one of the reasons he called together uh, the new group the new generation to go over the vision statement and the principles and the service principles because he knew they could get people could get lost unless they have this foundational piece that the, the most important thing is the practice in life and the and what centering prayer brings you to and with all the little practices that support that but but that can be and out of that comes the reinforcement of what he what he teaches in the spiritual journey tapes or the basic books that are there open mind open heart mystery of christ invitation to love intimacy with god those those four books could keep you going for a lifetime but as one spiritual leader said to me if i may end with a story for a change you know that the problem with you christians is you like drill for oil but you get bored after you've been down two miles and you never realize the next mile will open you to a reservoir of energy that will far surpass what you would ever dream of. We don't drill down enough. We like drilling down, take it out. Let's make another hole, drill it down, take it out. And if we just sort of like journey with our teacher or journey with the teaching, the answers will there be there and we'll get the fruitfulness of what is what what is what is there uh, does that make sense to you yeah it really does you you articulated that so well with the department store example and then going deep and i mean i totally agree with you and that's the message i share with people and and now you're explaining to me why they do they keep searching and they're looking in all these different places uh which i've done myself and so what you're saying is just really it's good if you can stay with something for a while and and really study it and i know um my centering prayer group we've read this we've watched the spiritual journey video series three times it takes us about 18 months to get through it because we watch 20 minutes at a time and right. oh we don't understand we certainly didn't understand aerobic and reptilian the first time we heard. Oh, yeah. But now on the third time, I'm beginning to get it. And I'm seeing this in more and more literature too. the parts of the brain, the reptilian brain. And so it's all right. sense to right. me now. So it does take time, but don't be discouraged if you don't understand it right away. Oh, right, right, right. If, 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 you know, if, when you started to try to walk, if you got discouraged the first time you fell, uh, look at you today you'd be all dressed up crawling it'd be mm -hmm. wonderful terrific you know mm -hmm. but the department store is a very good example really because mm -hmm. we do like going into you know um uh, the, the uh, sax isn't around anyway well going into is macy still around i yes, don't know but <laughs> okay you, we like we like going into to those stores but we also like to go to the specialty store Mm -hmm. for certain items yes yes my husband likes orvis do you go to orvis it's a fish oh my god yeah <laughs> <laughs> just went there the other day so okay <laughs> okay well thank you for your time and your wisdom this is going to be a very valuable uh video that i think people are really going to enjoy so thank you well you're you're welcome and i am so supportive of what you're doing what marie's doing what contemplative outreach is is doing as i, I see it as um the con contemplative outreach the beginning phases was emphasizing the contemplative and now the emphasis is on the outreach and it's a wonderful extension that's contained in the word itself of the organization contemplative mm -hmm. outreach Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for all your years of service and all the decision making that you had to make to get us to where we are because um, it's working and um, it's a beautiful community and we have direction and we have resources and we have the prayer. So thank you so much for You're welcome. Yes. Like I say, contemplative outreach is a miracle of God's grace 
and the power of prayer. Amen. Amen.